Welcome to Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity with your host, Lawrence Neal. So you are Bill De Simone, um, and you are originally from New Jersey, is that right? Or is that just where you reside now? Yes, primarily New Jersey most of my life, yeah. Okay, good. Um, and you a certified personal trainer for 30 years, is that right? Have I got that correct? Actually, uh, certifications came a bit after my peers and I started personal training. So uh, I've been a personal oh. trainer since 1983, <laughs> but the certifications didn't actually come along probably until the 90s. Got you. Okay. Um, and as I said, I first saw you on uh, the 21 convention um, talking about congruent exercise. Mm-hmm. Um, and on there, you said that you had been personal training for obviously quite a while. Uh, and then you had an incident in 98 where you ruptured your biceps and triceps training. Correct. Um, and that led you to study biomechanics more closely. And I guess led you to becoming the author of congruent exercise, how to make weight training easier on your joints. And moment arm exercise? Well, yes. Um, so a- actually what happened was by 1998, I had been training myself for well over 20 years. And I had been a personal trainer since 1983. So I, I, and I was also NSCA certified for a number of years. Although I, I, I primarily, like, I've been A certified since the 2000s. I was NSCA certified in the 90s. I was a high intensity Nautilus fan in the 80s and a bodybuilding fan in the 70s. So I had, I had a pretty wide range of, you know, practical material plus the certification material. Hmm. And then in 1998, I ruptured a bicep. In the same summer, I ruptured the biceps and the triceps on the same arm in different, different incidents. And in trying to figure out what happened, and then the, um, and then after everything healed, I was trying to figure out what was going on. So I, I put the exercise material aside and went to my physical therapist friend's bookshelves and rated them of their biomechanics and anatomy textbooks and rehab textbooks. And then, uh, so I rebuilt what I thought I knew from my own exercise, which turned into moment arm exercise, and then it turned into the videos. Then it turned into congruent exercise, and, and plus a number of talks I've given for different groups. Excellent, good stuff. Um, so, what the one thing I noticed is um, you've got some really good content in terms of the, the presentation you did at the Twenty One Convention, um, and a lot of the stuff you've got on YouTube and on your blog. And um, what I'm surprised is is you don't have a, a great presence online. Um, in terms of the amount of content, yet it's such good stuff that you're talking about. Why is that? Is that because you're focused on more the, the one-to-one personal training or focused on other things? Well, that's a good question. No, well, number one, I, I, I make my primary living as a personal trainer in the studio. So the, the overwhelming you know, share of my, my livelihood comes from training clients. So books, talks, videos, that has to, that's definitely secondary. But also another part of it is, you know, the Internet is like the Wild West. And there's just so many people available who, whose business is to take your money to tell you how to make more money in your business. <laughs> so I'm a, little, I'm a little leery of getting into things that are, that are over my head. I try to, I try to do like uh, someone described it as, as breadcrumbs marketing. So if someone knows to look for me, they can find me. But, for instance, you know, uh, to pop up on someone's screen as a banner ad or to pay for sponsored content, you know, you, you end up paying for people who aren't looking at you in the hopes of finding the person who is looking for you. So I've, I've kind of put sorting that out on a back burner while I concentrate on the content. Fair enough. Good, good answer. Um, so, so tell me, what are your uh, what are kind of long-term goals with your work? Um, going forward? Well, I think the mainstream audience may be receptive to the the joint friendly material because as you know, I've listened to some of your podcasts and most of the hit influenced guys 
nobody can believe the popularity of CrossFit or P90X or any of these extreme exercise approaches that to people who've come out of hit, it's just unfathomable to us that people would put up with the amount of injuries and the likelihood of injuries that come out of these things. Mm-hmm. The only problem is if you just rant and rave about how bad these things are, you only talk to the people who already see things your way. And if you have somebody who happens to, at say, let's say at the moment they like CrossFit or they like a kettlebell workout, they're having, they, maybe they're having some aches and pains, they're having some doubts. If, if you're just ranting against the thing they think they like, you're not really going to catch that person's attention. So it's kind of an art to, again, position yourself so that when they're receptive, they can find you. Because I ha- I've had a lot of clients who come to me with their P90X and say, you know, this is killing my shoulders, this is killing my knee, and I basically have to undo their workout routine. But only because I don't tell them how bad P90X is. You know, if, some- if somebody has already bought a product, they don't want to be told, that's terrible, you never should have bought that. It just doesn't fly. So it's kind of an art to position yourself as a resource without giving into the temptation to just rant and rave about the uh, whatever the product happens to be. No, I couldn't agree more. Sorry, go on. So the long-term goal is well is, is to make this material accessible to a broader fitness audience. I think the time might be right for that because you know in the last calendar year, for instance, Outside Magazine, Time Magazine, and Outside the Lines on ESPN all did major pieces on the injury rate and the approach to injuries coming out of CrossFit. And these are not just, you know, bloggers or disgruntled, jealous trainers. <laughs> you know, th- these are fairly reputable, you know, news agencies, news, news groups. So I think th- these things have been around long enough and enough people are getting, getting banged up that I might be able to get a little bit of traction with the uh, joint-friendly approach. Excellent. Yeah, I completely agree with you when you talk about, um, you know, when you're trying to help someone and it is about being skilled in the way you position yourself. And if you just start bad mouthing whatever they're really enjoying, you're just going to rub them up the wrong way. It's not very effective because, yeah. I mean, let, let's say, for instance, I, I'll get asked about equipment all the time. And if I'm asked after the person buys something, I'll just show them how to use it in a safe, you know, effective way. But I won't tell them, oh, this, this, this piece of equipment's terrible, even if it is, because they already bought it. You know, you don't want to make them feel bad for what, they are, what they've already committed to. I just think I'm, I'm a little more valuable as a trainer if I can work around certain things rather than the one right way approach, which a lot of the hit guys like to follow. I think I work best as, a, as more of a consultant. Now, if somebody asks me before they buy it, that's a different story. You know, you run the risk of, of losing a potential client or customer if you start criticizing something they think they like, even if they're having doubts about it. So, Yeah, that's a good point. It's something I definitely could learn from. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, well, I'm a bit older than you. I've had some practice. <laughs> um, that leads me on to the next question. Uh, what kind of, um, again, this is going to be quite expansive, but what kind of exercise do you advocate for most people and why? Well, I mean, you know, by my own self-written definition of joint-friendly fitness, I call it controlled cardio strength and stretching in a non-competitive setting. I know cardio is like, you know, anathema to hit guys, and I know my, my colleague, my, my, my online colleague James Steele has his video, there's no such thing as cardio. So I realize it's, it's a misnomer and I realize you're not isolating the heart, but it is a shorthand for ergometer work or some kind of rhythmic movement, whether it's outside or, or, you know, in a gym. So I include the cardio specifically as a warm up and for any benefits to the brain uh, that might be unique to this type of activity. So a few years ago, there was a, a book out called Spark by a guy named John Rady. And it, it basically talked about the brain benefits from rhythmic exercise compared to strength training or yoga. Uh, so he wasn't disparaging strength training or yoga, but he just felt that they were, he felt he could document specific benefits to the brain that the more rhythmic exercise had. And my own personal experience is that, quote, cardio, 
helps manage my waistline, my weight, results from my blood work, more so than just weight training and diet, say. But, you know, just to be clear, I'm not talking about training for a marathon. I'm talking about 10 to 30 minutes of ergometer or movement, a workout. I'm not talking about trying to train, you know, trying to run 26 miles. Hmm. So if I may, may ask, uh, sure. just interject there a second. You mentioned for, for, for weight management, um, but in the view on cardio that, you know, cardio burns such little calories, um, how do you justify that? Um, how do you consider that as a, a weight loss uh, activity? You know, I, I really don't justify it. First, I don't really have to, I don't really have to justify it to anybody personally. Like I know that again, I know the hit guys pull out the research proving cardio is no good. But you know, the other side, the ACE people and the ACSM people, they've got their their you know cherry pick studies also. So I don't really try to rationalize it. I do know if I do, like I say, ten to thirty minutes of cardio. Again, whether it's from calorie burning, whether it's from some hormonal effect, I just notice my weight stays smaller and my weight stays lower. Maybe it gives me a little more margin of error diet-wise. And just, you know, mood. If from nothing else other than the mood, it's a little bit different than finishing up a hard weight workout. So I really can't justify it, you know, to the hit guys who, who simply don't want to do it. You know, if they don't want to do it, they don't want to do it. I'm not, you know. But I just know for myself, for instance, I, I, I haven't done many bodybuilding competitions, but when I did, it was a half hour of cardio six days a week and a split routine and combined with diet. And again, what the whole mechanism was, I wasn't quite sure, but if I just did one or the other, it didn't work as well. Interesting. Sorry, I'm, I'm, it's the last time I interrupt you. Um, I just thought about this, actually, is that when I was talking to Doug, he said, we, he talked about, and he, you might remember him saying this, about um, that the marginal utility of body fat um, l- becomes less when you're more active, but there's, he, he was saying, you know, I, I, he didn't seem to know a study that, proved that but it was just his his feeling and it sounds like that's very similar to what you're saying it's not about necessarily calorie burn there's something else happening that maybe we don't understand yet is that fair to say well i'm not entirely doing this as an academic exercise you know so i don't have to i'm not as nitpicky as some of these guys are with proving to myself how it works or why it works let me give another example that given where i think you are in life might connect when I worked in New York City, I had a four-hour commute a day. So it didn't leave much time for coming home and doing a half-hour cardio. Simply not, that was just, it wasn't the time for it. But what I did was I would get off the bus, and wherever I had to go in New York City, I would walk, which ended up being about two hours of walking a day, five days a week for 20 years. And then about 15 years or so, though, I stopped working in New York and started doing training locally. Didn't walk nearly as much, but since I never regarded that walk as exercise, I also didn't add a half hour of cardio a day. And sure enough, steadily over 15 years, and granted, I am also 15 years older, my weight crept up, my waistline crept up, my blood work got slowly worse, with no other changes until I realized that was it. My physical activity was drastically reduced from 15 years ago. So, was it the calorie burning? Was it something else? Well, might have been something else. Interesting. Um, good stuff. Okay. So, I interrupted you, but you were kind of going. You were going through your the type of exercise you advocate for uh, yes. people. Yes. Yes. So, so now, so after um, generally after the after so, me or a client does whatever cardio they're going to do. I move into the weights because now they're thoroughly warmed up. And so there's, there's no real concern for warming up during the weight exercise. And so the, the strength training is definitely hit influenced more so than, you know, high volume or kettlebell class type strength training. And then after that, I mean, we can, we'll talk, I'm sure we'll talk more about that. And then uh, finish up the workout with some stretching. And again, I know this is another thing the hit guys love to disparage, but I use it, well, with, with clients, I definitely use it as a cool down. I don't want them to leave, like after a brutal set of leg presses, for instance, you know, and then they walk outside and faint. <laughs> I'd rather they cool down in front of me. But also, best justification I've heard for stretching was from Chris at Conditioning Research a few years ago, and he described it as uh, restoring postural deficits. 
So, for instance, if somebody is hunched over a keyboard or a monitor all day, and their shoulders roll forward, and their chest is caved in, and their 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 upper back takes more of a you know more of a curve with a head forward position, well, wh- why wouldn't I stretch that person? You know, use a doorway stretch for that person, or some sort of pectoral stretch. I mean, it's going to add 30 seconds to the workout. It's not exactly too much of an imposition. Or somebody sits all day and their hamstrings are are literally tight, which seems to have an effect on future low back pain, chronically tight hamstrings. Again, why not take the 30 seconds to do a static stretch? I'm not doing it to, you know, lengthen the muscles or change the look of the muscle or change the shape or any of the usual hit criticism of stretching along those lines. But I, I've seen too many clients come to me as they're older and their postural changes have, have really settled into their structure, into their, their joints or their spine. So if according to physical therapists, as long as it's a muscular issue, it still can be corrected, I have no problem with adding some stretching. Now again, if somebody comes into me and their posture is perfect and there doesn't appear to be any deficits, well, we may not do stretching. It may not be a good use of their time. But based on the individual circumstance, <laughs> you know, I, I have no no problem with including it. Good stuff. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, are you familiar? And I might be pronouncing this wrong, but are you familiar with Egoscu? Is that what it's called? You know, not entirely. I know who and what you're talking about. And to be honest with you, it's not that I um, dislike the guy's material, but I try to stay away from kind of contemporaries' material because I don't want to inadvertently rip them off. Okay. So if I'm writing stuff, I try not to look at, say, Tom Purvis's stuff or Egoscu's stuff because I don't want to inadvertently, you know, claim an idea that's mine. Right, I see. Okay. Um, now, the reason I brought that up is just because um, Tim Ferriss uh, in 4-Hour Body, are you familiar mm-hmm. with Tim? Yep. Yes, I am. Um, he wrote about Egoscu, I think that this is what it was for, um, for a... Uh, rehab from uh, prolonged sitting you know I, I used to have an I uh, well I've been in sales for sort of six years um, and so sitting at a desk for six to eight hours a day um, and even though now I mean now I'm I'm, I'm unemployed at the moment um, and I move and stand as much as possible I'm at a standing desk right now and I do practice high intensity training I do use a lower back machine to strengthen my back but even now and again, if I'm bending over and I'm doing stuff for a prolonged period of time, I do feel a slight pain there. And I, I could be wrong. It might, you know, I could be getting, might not be causative, but I think that it is from the extended time sitting. So uh, anyway, so this is Egoscu exercises in four hour body that, um, well, I, I've not done them repetitively to see the benefits or enough to see the benefits, but that's kind of his, you know, quick fix if there is one. <laughs> well, uh, but you know something, I think, you're kind of getting uh, you're getting to one of your later questions here about uh, the state of of high intensity training. One mistake I think a lot of the hit writers make is they're far too locked in on you know Arthur Jones's Norless Bulletin One, and to the point where they ignore something like you're talking about, like uh, you know some mobilization exercise. You know, not everybody is Casey. You know, people have low back issues, they have shoulder issues, knee issues. And there is a role for the rehabilitative or prehab type exercise. Uh, you know, not everything has to train to failure. Not has to, everything has to fall within a 30 to 60 second window. You know, not everything has to be cam. Sometimes you are doing something just to mobilize it or stabilize the joint. So, now the good thing about HIT is since it is so compressed time-wise, you do have the time to do these other things. Which, you know, if you're following a, uh, you know, like a, a P90X where it's an hour and a half workout of somewhat random hodgepodge, you're not going to make the time to do the mobilization, stabilization stuff. So, you know, one of the good things about HIT is the sheer time saving. Yeah. Just on that, I'd be really interested in your, your own exercise program that you advocate, the, the resistance training part of that. How closely related is that to HIT and what does that look like normally? Well, it's not purest hardcore hit. I mean, everything is done under control, so there's no uh, no heaving and dropping or clanking the weights. And I do move people towards failure, so to speak, in that I do make it progressive. But I don't really get locked into one set only, two failure, no rest, next exercise, two failure. You know, I learned a long time ago that just because a client's coming to a trainer doesn't necessarily mean they want to train as hard as a trainer trains himself. 
unfortunately, a couple of vomiting clients taught me that lesson. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, so, uh, so you know, you know, to my eye, if you're shoving a hit philosophy down someone's throat and they don't come back, well, it doesn't do you or the client any good. So I, I kind of use hit as a model, as a training model. And, you know, some people are past it. Some people I do a little extra with or push a little harder. Some people are approaching that. But I don't, I'm not rigidly dogmatic on everything under the heading of hit. If, if someone is sufficiently motivated and will do whatever is necessary to get the best results, do you feel that high intensity training to momentary muscular failure is the way? Well, you know, it's an interesting question, right? I mean, if hit's been around for 40 years, you would think there'd be somebody other than the Mensers and Casey and, uh, and Yates to, to have outrageous success with it. So the real answer is, I don't think so. I don't know what the answer really is. But that's not to say that it's not without value. I think HIT has a lot to offer most people. You know, is one 15-minute workout going to create the next Mr. Olympia or MMA champion? doesn't really appear that way, does it? Um, yeah, I mean, I know you probably know this, but um, what the, you know, a lot of the um, HIT crowd would say is, well, you know, the reason why everyone's doing all this other stuff is because of the, um, the media um, and the amount of money that's made through selling all sorts of different weird and wonderful um, training programs and, and supplements, etc. Um, do, you, do you feel that that is perhaps the reason why HIT hasn't took hold or do you feel that it, do you, do you kind of stick to what you said and say, you know what, it probably isn't the most effective protocol there is? Well, both, both, both can be true. Yeah. <laughs> right, both both can be true. Right, it, it, it could. Uh, well, let's take let's you know without getting too theoretical. I'm much more comfortable with the practical. Right. Okay. Who's the most successful hit bodybuilder co- competition wise? Probably Mike Menser. Yeah. And if you read John Little stuff about Mike Menser, he's pretty clear that he thought his most productive routine was four days a week, a split routine, half hour, four days a week. And yes, he was taking steroids, but so was everybody else at the time. And if you look at those, those early routines from the 70s that Menser did, they're nothing like these consolidation routines or even one set to failure routines. They, they are two or three sets, sometimes four sets on a muscle. And that's the most successful hit bodybuilder around. So now compared to what everybody else was doing at the time, that was dramatically less and all. And, and he was probably much closer to right than everybody else was at the time. But if the most successful guy was doing four days a week, three or four sets on a muscle, why would, how would anyone conclude that you know one set, one exercise once a week was a superior protocol in terms of results? Again, compared to zero times a week, one time a week is genius. So you have to be careful what exactly we're talking about. Are we talking about the most benefit regardless of anything, or are we talking about I have one 15-minute time to exercise a week. What's the best way for me to do it? Yeah, I appreciate your point. Uh, I guess I was kind of focused more on the former, the effectiveness, you know, no, no restrictions, no limitations. Well, okay, so, so again, you know, the, you have Menser. Uh, of all the bodybuilding champions in the last 40 years, he probably did the least volume of anybody. And that was still more than single set, you know, single set once a week. There's actually not a lot of examples to pick from, are there? <laughs> No, that's the problem. <laughs> right? There's not, there's not a lot of guys claiming to, to use HIT extensively with, with too much um, notoriety. What does your workout look like at the moment, Bill? See, now, keep in mind that I have the time and I have the personal training studio. Mm-hmm. So uh, generally I'm doing a half hour of some kind of ergometer, usually listening to a podcast while I'm doing it. And I'm not particularly killing myself. I'm, I'm working what I consider moderately hard. For all the reasons I said before, I find it easier to manage my weight, my waist, thoroughly warmed up. And then usually, I would say, I, if I, I could do my weight routine all in one day, but generally I split it just because I like to feel, you know, if I do four exercises to failure, I can get on with my day. If I do a dozen exercises to failure and one at workout, it puts a bit of a dent. But I'm not too, like I said, I'm not too rigid. If I know I have a busy week coming up, I might do all the weight exercises on a Sunday 
and not worry about it. If it's a normal week, I'll once I'm warmed up from the cardio, I'll do three or four exercises and uh, like on a split routine. But it's pretty vanilla after that. I mean, um, I use uh, an assisted chin-up machine because I think it, I can keep stricter form on it than uh, freehand chin-ups. I use um, Nautilus Nitro, either a chest press or um, dumbbell presses. I'll use a... Um, Either dumbbells or elastic bands for, for uh, uh, rear delt work. That might be, say, Monday's workout. Maybe I'll throw shrugs in there right, right before the delt work. And then the next day's workout or the next time I work out might be like a weighted crunch, an inclined curl, tricep press down, and maybe either like a, uh, a gripper or a wrist roller. And that, at a minimum, I do that because most of the ergometer work I do is lower body, so I, I don't feel the need to have to add, add a leg press, for instance. And then I have like another day that I'll do what I call prehab type exercises. I'll do stuff to stabilize the ankles, uh, like with bands, or I'll do terminal knee extensions to keep my knees from aching, rotator cuff work. So that's so that's you know on a good week I get I get all three of those workouts in, and then if I really have the time, nope, that's really about it. <laughs> Come to think of it, no, that's that's really about it. <laughs> now, you know, getting to one of your other questions here about the importance of general daily mobility, mm. I can't, you know, document it, but I try to be. So, for instance, part of doing that cardio exercise is to just move. On Sundays, I'll do jujitsu. During the week, I'll use a yoga DVD, not because of any, like I said, muscle lengthening or any kind of spiritual type benefits, because, but just because it's movement. Yeah. So, and again, I don't have any, any research to prove it, but I know I physically feel better the more regular I am with that type of stuff. Mm. Yeah, I can, I can understand that. Yeah, sounds good. Um, just moving on to uh, kind of the, the injury prevention side mm. of things. Um, what are the most common causes of injury in people that work out that you see in, in your experience? Well, fortunately, I don't see too much in my studio, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and... I mean, obviously, you know, you start looking at CrossFit. It's they're just you couldn't you couldn't start to pick apart the stuff they do is so obviously out of control that you can't be surprised that anybody gets hurt. But I would say, like in the hit context, probably using the extreme uh, the extreme loading the extreme stretch, like getting too much of a range of motion, is probably wearing the joints out a little faster than than otherwise. Is that the same as hypermobility? Well, hypermobility is when you get away with it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not hypermobile, right. you're going to have an injury. So, for okay. instance, you know, um, let's, take, let's take a dumbbell fly just as an easy visual. If you are on a bench and your arms in the dumbbell fly, if you're lowering the dumbbells and they are, say, parallel to the floor, that's probably far enough. If you allow the dumbbells to pull your arms back past the plane of your body, you might get away with it, and someone might claim to be hypermobile, but at some point in the future, you're likely to run into some kind of anterior instability problem. You know, you're not really benefiting the muscle. You're just stretching out the ligaments of the joint. So I know myself, before, I, before video was pretty common and before I, I trained with serious trainers, my interpretation of the words was, well, if a, good, if a full range of motion is good and even more extreme range of motion was better which I now see as a major, major mistake. Right. What are, what are the few things that people can fix right away um, to reduce the risk of injury or long-term damage? Like what, just some sort of big mistakes you see that would dramatically reduce the amount of sort of injuries that occur? Well, first, let's keep in mind that, you know, injury isn't just an acute injury, right? So frequently I'll answer this question and someone will say, well, I've done that exercise for years, I haven't had a problem. Okay, well, A, you might be lucky. But B, you might not have a problem yet. You know, we're really talking about accelerating the wear and tear on a joint more so than, like, you know, shoulder exploding or kneecap flying off. So with that in mind, that what we're really talking about is avoiding the chronic condition. Probably the first thing would be to prevent the resistance from pushing you into a stretch. So if someone's on a machine or free weights, if the machine or the resistance is pushing you into the stretch, you're probably putting the joint in a vulnerable position. Ultimately, you have to look at each joint, each muscle, each, each exercise to figure out exactly where that is. But as a general rule, prevent the resistance from pushing you into a stretch. Can you give an example of that, like in a position in a particular exercise? Let's say any kind of chest work, okay? If you're looking straight ahead... 
keep your hands in your peripheral vision. Now, that's going to give you a little bit of a margin of error, all right? It's not, that's not a very precise joint angle at the shoulder. But if you're doing a peck fly machine, for instance, and you can't see your hands, you're probably overstretching the shoulder joint. If you're doing um, dumbbell chest press, and again, your hands disappear below, below where you, you see in the peripheral vision, you know, you may not be overstretching, but you're definitely a lot closer than if you can actually see the dumbbells. So, as a rule of thumb, if you can see your hands, you're probably safe on, on pretty much any upper body exercise, come to think of it, right? I mean, uh, you know, behind the neck pull downs and behind the neck presses have been out of fashion for a long time, and you can't see your hands. Yeah. Yeah, no, that was really interesting, actually, when you talked about um, why, um, I, I call that a military press, a behind the neck press, it's the same thing. I think um, military is implied that the bar is in front of your face oh, okay. as opposed to uh, behind the neck press. Okay. Um, but no, just on that point, it was, uh, I, didn't, I didn't understand that that was really kind of incongruent uh, bar mechanics, having the bar behind the neck, although I always knew there was something not quite right about it. Um, well, th- as far as that goes, though, some people without a weight in their hand, they can't bring their elbows back far enough to clear their head with, say, a broomstick. Yeah. So why would you load a bar in that position? Yeah. If you can't get in there with no weight in your hands, why would putting a bar in that somehow be better? There's more technical reasons, which is why you write textbooks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the, the explanation doesn't work as well verbally. But, right, you know, again, a, a wide grip press behind the neck. It, let's put it this way. If you can't get into the position without a weight in your hands, putting a weight in your hands doesn't improve it. Yeah, that's a good example. Um, and which exercises do you consider completely ineffective and shouldn't be practiced? I suppose it's quite easy to go back to CrossFit with this, but any particular well, exercises? I think it's more useful to, to almost like grade the exercises. So, for instance, the Nautilus Nitro leg press that has the seat back that fills in the curves in your back, that's very easy to manage the strain on the joints. A barbell squat, much more challenging to manage the strain on the joints. In fact, and, and, and most people probably don't. Most people probably aren't managing their spine curves when they're doing a barbell squat. That doesn't mean no one, that, that's not the same as saying no one should ever do a barbell squat. I mean, I personally won't because I know I personally have a problem with it, but it can be done safely. It's just not easy to do safely. So I tend to not, like, you know, write off an exercise completely. I think in terms of more of, like, you know, one would be an A, one would be a B, one would be a C. Very few Fs. I would say, I'll tell you an F. Putting a barbell on your shoulders and doing a step up on a bench. That one is an F. Why is that? Well, that one, there have been two, at least two college football players in the U.S. doing that exercise who fell. Uh, one of whom ended up paralyzed. The other one damaged his spine but was able to walk and play and play again. But... That is just an inherently bad idea for an exercise. You know, you have the bar on your shoulders, you step up on a bench, and that's great at the beginning of the set. And now at the end of the set, your legs are burning, your lungs are breathing, your bar is still on your shoulders, you're on top of the bench, and now what do you do? There's no racks up there, right? You're probably not stepping forward because you're afraid the bar is going to make you pitch forward, right? So now you, with your legs locked... So the exercise is easier. Now you're fishing behind you with your foot, and now you're going to bend your knees, creating a bigger moment arm, making the exercise much harder, and you hope that you land and don't twist your ankle, and you can somehow re-rack the bar. I mean, what a bad idea. Because you'd, you'd have to clean the bar back onto your chest as well after that, wouldn't you? Well, exactly. Where, how, do you, how do you get the bar? How do you st- the exercise is great, aside from the start and the finish. <laughs> You know, <laughs> aside from getting into and getting out of it, it's great exercise. Now, again, people who like that exercise will say, well, we've done that exercise for years with hundreds of athletes and never had a problem. But that just means lucky, you know. When it does, when the injury does happen, it's like, oh, yeah, of course. What else do you recommend to people to prevent injury but whilst getting maximum output from their workouts? Well, maximum output's an interesting idea, right? I mean, it might, it, it might be that you can't get maximum without some risk of injury. That's why my studio is called optimal exercise, not maximal exercise. Right, so, I mean, I'm, I'm okay with getting the most I can subject to the safety uh, restriction. But the other thing that seems to be universally underemphasized is protecting the curve in your lower back. 
So, you know, you'll frequently see people on a leg press, especially one without the curves built in, and their spine bends the wrong way, you know, like their knees will come up too close to their body, their spine flips the wrong way, or they'll be deadlifting or doing some kind of um, hyperextension on a bench, and again, they'll lose the curve in their lower back. Not necessarily, like again, an acute injury, like a disc is going to explode, but it's pretty clear from the anatomy and biomechanics textbooks that... The safest way to load through, through the lower back is through the lumbar, through the natural curve. Just because we walk into a gym doesn't, doesn't, you know, doesn't wave that away. But the ultimate thing though is you really have to look at, like every exercise, figure out what the safe way to handle, how the safe way to move the joint is, and the safe way to move the muscle, sort of like on an exercise by exercise basis. Or, or read somebody who, who's done that and written books about it. <laughs> Not that I have anybody in mind, but, you know, you either do that, you, people can do that themselves, right? And, or, you know, now the, the information is easily available, not like in the 70s when the only information you could find was uh, the muscle magazines in the newsstand. Yeah. Um, just to take a step back to make sure I understand something is you mentioned just then that um, you might increase the risk of injury to get a maximum output out of a physical conditioning workout. I understand that because... I guess I'm slightly biased, as you already know, uh, <laughs> and I've I've kind of um, I I thought that all exercise, no matter how intense or productive it might be, should always be safe. Look, um, I thought it went without saying, and then along comes CrossFit and P90X, and not only do they dismiss the risk from exercise, they they glorify the injuries. Uh, so yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I think I think exercise should be safe goes without saying, but. Uh, Apparently, we're in the minority. I, I, I got you. Sorry, I misunderstood. I, I get you now. <laughs> um, okay, so again, I, I, I read your book ages ago, and I started rereading it, but um, I'm yet to finish it and kind of refresh my mind. But what are the most effective exercises that are congruent with our biomechanics? Um, is if, again, I know you graded it, but if you had to sort of provide a top three, is, is that possible? Yeah, well, well, what I would do, like, for instance, you know, like the so-called big three, some form of leg press, some sort of press, and some sort of pull, right? So if you're in a well-equipped gym, I would use a nitro leg press because it has a, the low back curves built into it. Again, I personally use a nitro chest press, but any machine chest press or dumbbells, that, and if you keep your hands, again, in, that, in the peripheral vision, is probably safe. Again, you know, individual differences aside, of course. And then some kind of pull, a chin up or a row or a uh, a pull down. I've gotten away from letting people sag their shoulders out at the stretch. Uh, I try to keep, have people keep their shoulders locked down. So again, if you're in a well-equipped gym, there'll be a nitro leg press, a nitro chest press, and uh, some form of row. If you're home, I would go with a, a hip belt squat possibly, or like a freehand squat. Dumbbell row where you're really bracing yourself well and not twisting your back. And uh, possibly like a push-up. And rather than make the push-ups harder, like by going between chairs and, and overstretching the shoulder, I would try to use like one of those elastic devices so that if, uh, you know, if you're hitting 10 push-ups easily, for instance, you put the elastic on your back and it provides more resistance. That's fascinating. Do you know the name of that? You know what? Not offhand. But whether you use just like conventional generic tubing that you put under one hand over your shoulders and under the other hand, or you use the specific, you know, uh, push-up product, it's really depend. That's a question of preference. The idea is to make the push-up harder without overstretching the shoulder. And someone said on the the Twenty One Convention interview, they said that they raised their feet. Do you recommend that as well, as well as perhaps the elastic to to if you're at that advanced level? Yeah, well, raising the feet, um, yeah, changes the angle a bit. Offhand, I can't think of anything particularly negative about raising the feet. So, so you know, there is a certain amount of, even within safe guidelines or the guidelines I like to put out, there's still a lot of uh, room for individual preference. Yeah, and that's, that's some great advice, actually, and tips on especially home workout. I, I never thought about doing the, the row with the dumbbells and... Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's, great, that's great advice. Um, I've got a question for you, actually, for my own workout. Um, I use a, a MedEx horizontal leg press um, at Kaiser Training, which is a, 
then if you're familiar with the, the Kaiser sort of high intensity training. I'm familiar with what Darden yeah. wrote about it in one of his uh, later books. Okay, cool. Um, so something twigged actually. I was when I was listening to your your presentation. Um, I, again, I can't remember exactly what it is now, but uh, obviously I, I use the leg press um, to fatigue my calves, hamstrings, glutes, and quads. Um, but one thing you said is if you don't, haven't got the settings right, you don't work out correctly using the horizontal leg press, you won't get at your hams and glutes necessarily as well. How do oh, I, I, I feel like I am, <laughs> but I just want to get your view on how should you be using the ho- a horizontal leg press machine effectively? Well, I don't have too much experience with, you said it was a Medex? That's correct, yeah. Okay. But in general... You know, the old conventional rule of thumb was that if the seat back was like at 90 degrees, it was almost vertical, and that you had to let your knees come into your armpits to, to get at the glutes and the hamstrings, for instance. But I go the opposite way. I recline the seat as much as possible so that your body position is more like a freehand squat. And the reason for that is the joint angle of a peak torque for the glutes is it's much more you're much closer to loading that in that in that body weight squat position than you are bent like a really close 90 degree upper body mm. so if you're if the leg press if your leg press is, is almost vertical the seat back is almost vertical and your knees come into your armpits and your lower back you know bends the wrong way well by the time you lock out the exercise is over your glutes aren't really close to where they can generate the most torque. Mm-hmm. If you recline the seat back, you may actually be able to get, get into that angle. Now, the feel is a little bit different because when you're only pressed, when you're really compressed in the leg press, you, you feel something back there, but what you're really feeling is just, is just that you're, you're loading the muscles at a, at a biomechanically weak point. Right? So if you feel a sticking point, it doesn't necessarily mean if it's an effective exercise. If you don't feel any sticking point, if all you feel is effort through the rep, then you're situated right. Oh, interesting. I think I've got that right then because the seat is, is definitely reclined and I don't have, it's not vertical and I haven't got my, my knees coming into my armpits. Um, yeah, so that sounds, that sounds about right. Um, but it's good to just kind of run it by you. Um, cool. Okay, shifting gears slightly. Um, <laughs> I asked Drew about kettlebells the other day and uh, he didn't seem to like them very much. What do you think about kettlebells? Well, I've actually spent much of the summer trying to figure out the fascination with kettlebells. <laughs> All right. Because my gut reaction is they don't make sense. Like building classes around all these moves with kettlebells, I just see the, the, the possibility for injury just in just about every everything they do with the kettlebell I see as a potential disaster. But I looked at Pavel's material and Tim Ferriss's material and Tracy Rifkin's material. And one thing that's kind of interesting is those three are all big on basically doing one kettlebell movement, the two-arm, the two-arm swing, sure. which is kind of fascinating because most kettlebell exercise routines are dozens of movements and all sorts of twisting and flipping the bell over your head. And, and no, those three, it's pretty much the two-arm swing. And like I said earlier, you know, if somebody says, what do you think of kettlebells, and you go off in a rant, well... That person might think there's some value to them. They're really trying to figure out a safe way to use them. So I decided to stop going with the rant to try to figure it out. And as best I can tell, if you do the two-arm, and I'm going to say swing in quotes, that has a shot at being done safely without too much strain. You you do have to make sure you keep your lower back curved, and you do have to control it, and and there's a lot of nuance. There's a lot more nuance in it than it looks. Because I've seen other alleged kettlebell authorities, and I don't see for the life of me how they continue to do this without completely shredding their lower backs. So the answer is, if somebody insists on using one, two-arm swing seems to be effective and fairly manageable from a safety point of view. But just about everything else, I just don't, you know. Putting it in one hand, I just do not see the advantage. I see a lot of risks to the lower back. Letting the kettlebell go, swinging the kettlebell overhead, I think for obvious reasons, like dropping it on your head, it just could be a disaster. And letting the kettlebells pivot in your hand and, and smack the back of your forearm, again, I just don't see what, what the upside is. 
Yeah, so it's a good answer. I struggle with this, and it's probably because, like you said, I am young and naive. Um, well, you, you said that. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't say that. You said that. <laughs> no, I did. You're right. Um, and you know, I've I've, I've obviously read uh, Body by Science and a lot of the high intensity training stuff and Four Hour Body, etc. I, I try and I guess I do try and embrace the science. Um, although I think you're kind of teaching me to look further than that. Um, and when I think about it, I think, well, okay. How does a kettlebell um, deliver more results than, you know, resistance training? I just don't see how it can, apart from maybe um, some mobility benefit. But, you know, from a depleting glycogen stores and fatiguing muscle, I just, yeah, this is where I get a bit confused. So do you think it's effective and how? Well, I haven't got this fully thought through yet. Mm -hmm. But are you familiar with a, um, well, first of all, it's not really supposed to be a swing. All right? You're not supposed to be swinging the kettlebell. Because if, if you're thinking that you're swinging the kettlebell, you're going to unavoidably round your lower back. You're going to reverse the lumbar curve. And with reps and with weight, that's just clearly going to set you up for a problem later on. Mm-hmm. If you think of that exercise as a, a jump squat and the kettlebell is keeping you from leaving the floor... All right, so if you have the kettlebell between your feet and your, your lumbar curve is intact, and so now you're, in effect, doing a deadlift, right? You're in a body position for a bent leg deadlift. Okay. And now you're going to you're gonna come out of the squat forcibly. Your hip drive is going to push the kettlebell away from you, which gives the illusion of the swing, okay? But you're, really not, you're not trying to do a front raise with the kettlebell. You're just holding on to the kettlebell to keep it from flying, flying off and, you know, smacking somebody. So now, if you were to say barbell or machine squat, let's say you did six repetitions every 30 seconds for 10 minutes, okay? Mm -hmm. You'd be breathing heavy, your heart rate would be up, you'd be developing, you know, some burning fatigue in the quads and and the glutes. You know, is that better than one set to failure on a leg press? Well, I mean, I'm sure you could argue it either way, okay? Well, so now what you do is you substitute the kettlebell for that squat. And so if you were to do six to ten repetitions, keeping a lumbar curve, jumping with, you're basically jumping with the kettlebell in your hand, managing how high it goes and managing it on the way down. Again, the same thing. Your heart's going to race, the breathing's going to get heavier, you're going to build up some lactic acid. It's definitely not one, it's not conducive to one set to failure training, but in the metabolic, I could see it being valuable like in the metabolic conditioning, for instance. Now, there's useful and there's there's necessary. I don't know if it's necessary. It could be useful, right, if somebody has no lower back problems and if they can manage it. Again, is it necessary? No. But, I mean, necessary is kind of in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> That's a good answer. Do you listen to the Tim Ferriss show? You know, I haven't. I, I had some... Um, he and I have crossed paths a few times in, in the past. Hey, man. Um, I did a video on snow shoveling a few years ago. All right. Which was kind of a... Uh, I had done a bunch of the, the moment arm videos, and then uh, right before Christmas it snowed, so I did, I did sort of like a, a parody of my own videos using snow shoveling. And he tweeted it, and it must have got, you know, 6,000 views as a result of his tweet. <laughs> so, uh, and then we've talked... We, we talked while he was doing the four-hour body. He was thinking of using some material because he had read the moment arm exercise book. Oh, wow, okay. But to be very honest with you, I'm just now getting into methodically listening to podcasts, which is where that half hour of cardio comes in. <laughs> I mean, that's a great idea, yeah. Why not? Why not uh, kill two birds with one stone? Um, where I was getting at was uh, I recently listened to Tim Ferriss interview Pavel, I think it's Satsulin, is how you say it. Um, I could be getting that wrong. I, I don't know. That's why I just say Pavel. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably a better idea. Um so it was interesting because it, everything Pavel said flew in the face of HIT, and he is quite, a, from what I've seen on the internet, quite aggressive towards the the HIT guys, and thinks they're full of crap, and that they call them HIT Jedi's. Um, now, again, I should actually um, just caveat that by saying that it could be some really horrible journalist uh, impersonating Pavel. Um, but anyway, in this interview, he advocates volume training to build size. Um, you know, 
from my own point of view, I'm a lean guy. I've always sort of struggled to put on size. And so I'm always like, oh, what is the magic bullet? You know, <laughs> what's the latest right. thing I the can ever... Magic bullet, right. Not that there is one. Um, now, what do you think um, is best for size? Do you think it's volume training or do you think it's HIT or something else? Or what are your views around that? Well, you know, I am um, in uh, Darden's... In the, the, the book Darden did that's horizontally bound, I think it's the... Uh, New bodybuilding for old school results or vice versa. Oh, I've got in the new high intensity training. Is it not that one? Not that one. That okay. one, that's with the, uh, Andy McCutcheon, I think. Oh, it's, it's Ellington Darden, this one I was referring to. Right, right, no, no. The main subject oh, no. in it is, uh, a very ripped guy from the UK, as a matter of fact. Oh, okay. But in it, he has a chapter and he reprinted some stuff I had said. Uh, so I don't think it's a question of hit or volume. I mean, I think you have to lift heavy because the fast twitch fibers are the ones that have the capacity to grow. But at the same time, you have to bring some kind of burning. You have to get the lactic acid going to prompt the hormonal changes. So I don't really think the question is one of weight versus volume as much as it is getting the best of both. So, you know, if volume is all light sets, of course, I don't think anyone would pretend that works. So the volume is just a, is just a way of counting it. I think it's really a question of you have to train heavy and the muscles have to burn so that you're getting the fast twitch fibers which have the capacity to grow and you're getting the whatever hormonal changes that you can prompt naturally. Now, let's face it, most of those guys aren't worried about prompting it naturally. But again, you know, getting back to Menser, his routines that he claimed were the best routines for him, they were not single set routines. There was some volume, not, you know, not dozens of sets, but there was some more volume than one. Yeah. So I'm just taking some notes of all the um, people we've talked about today because obviously they'll all go in the show notes. All, the, all, all the name dropping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and well, it's good stuff for people to um, to to look into if they want to find out more. Um, okay, cool. Thank you for answering that. So um, let's go back to mobility for a moment. Um, I came across a really interesting guy on the London Real podcast called Idu Portal. Are you familiar with him? No, that name doesn't ring a bell. Okay, so he's like a movement expert, um, and he's in an incredible condition, um, and his whole thing is about, you know, he does do some um, weightlifting, but it's a lot of this sort of um, one-handed one, uh, handstands, um, you know, combination of all this kind of calisthenics and um, parkour type, mo- type movements, like really unusual stuff. Um, but it did get me thinking about, you know, should we have a, a movement practice, which you kind of do, what well, you do in your, your workout, which is um, obviously something I only, only just discovered. Um, so, so just h- harping on about that, do you, think, um, do you think it's really important to have a movement practice that just, I guess, um, yeah, it looks after your body in, in combination with, with some resistance training? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, uh, like, like I've never been one of these guys who wants to strength train once a week for 20 minutes and then do nothing physical all week long. Mm. You know, so whether it's a sport or dance or yoga or martial arts or a movement practice, I mean, I think, I think you just have to cover the base. I don't think it, I don't think you have to have a special, I don't think you necessarily have to have a special movement workout. Um, like I said, in my case, the yoga and the jujitsu takes care of it. Mm. And if I was super pressed for time, I would probably do the work, the weight workout, you know, if I really truly did not have the time versus the movement workout. Because let's face it, most people move in the course of their day, right? So it's e- it's easy enough to take the steps instead of an escalator, or you know, to walk to the train instead of taking a cab. So, but as a general rule, like I said, I wouldn't be against it. Like I said, I I I, I just don't build it in as its own entity. Yeah, I think I think you make a good point there, which is just making the effort to increase the amount of activity you do every day like I do the same as you I you know today I was um commuting about central London and where there was stairs instead of a lift I'd I'd always take the stairs um and I'll, I will always try and if I, if I can walk somewhere and you know still be productive and still do what I need to do that day I will always walk right um right. so yeah no I, I absolutely agree with you um what um you mentioned in uh, your presentation uh, Prime Mover, Natural History of Muscle. Yes. Um, but what, 
what books, other books do you recommend? And what do you think are the best books out there for people to really kind of um, learn a lot about health and fitness? Because there's a lot of, lot of rubbish out there. So what, what oh, do yeah. you recommend? Well, I mean, that the one you mentioned, uh, Prime Mover by Stephen Vogel. Mm-hmm. That's kind of an academic book, although it's not uh, it's not a it's not like a dry textbook. But that one is fascinating because it's if you take every you know pseudo science article written in the muscle and fitness magazines in 20 years, when you read that book, you realize that the biologists have answered those questions many years ago. You know how muscle works is not really a mystery. You know, all the muscle magazines and that mentality has made it into some kind of mystical thing, but really it's pretty cut and dry. And he also kind of explains uh, leverages, which is also a very underemphasized part of, like, a lot of personal training curriculums. So that one, you know, I think that one is critical for understanding muscle. There is a hardcore textbook called Brunstrom's Clinical Kinesiology. Oh, how do you spell that? B-R-U-N-N. S-T-R-O-M, so it's Brunstrom's Clinical Kinesiology. Now, that one, I believe, it has like seven or eight editions. And to be honest with you, any of the editions are fine. I mean, if you're not a student and you have to have the most current one. And that is a hard read. That is definitely a reference book, a hardcore textbook. But, again, there is no speculation as to how joints are supposed to work. You know, they don't all work in 90-degree axes like uh, machines would, would imply. So for anyone who wants to understand how the joints work... And it goes into a little bit of muscle there also, like how they work around the joint. But that's that's the other. Those are the main two I, I like. Okay. After that, there's one called The Concise Book of Muscles by a Chris Jarmy, J-A-R-M-E-Y. And that is an anatomy book. But the way he did it was to sort of like fade out the not relevant structures. So it really gives you an idea of where the muscles attach and what directions they pull in. And that one also has multiple editions. I don't think it really matters which edition it is. Okay. So clearly I'm not getting affiliate money for this because I'm being very vague. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, it's good stuff. I mean, I like the fact that you've gone for the hardcore science, um, you know, as opposed to, I guess, a lot of books out there which are um, people who are collectors of ideas rather than being... Um, scientists and well listen, look for, for many years I, I did exactly that you know I mean if, if Darden wrote 120 books I had 120 of his books but after after you've read you know 80 of them you kind of got you kind of get it <laughs> <laughs> now having said that I have to say his last three books and especially the most recent one the one on I believe it's called Body Fat Breakthrough where he talks about the negative accentuated training his last three books are really, really be- best things he's written. Period. Really? End of story. Yeah. Interesting. Um, body, body fat breakthrough. Yeah, and then there's the the one you have, the new yeah. high intensity. That's kind of like a, a off white cover. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty good. That one's pretty good. And the one in between, which I, I believe is new bodybuilding for old school results. Well, the body fat breakthrough one. He talks about his thirty seconds negative, thirty seconds positive, thirty seconds negative routine which I think is really brilliant. And he's also got uh, probably five or six chapters in it talking about like the evolution of negative training, pros and cons. So when I'm particularly motivated to train hard, that's the technique in the book I break out. Interesting. Okay, I'll definitely have to look into some of that. Um, yeah, that's good stuff. Well, um, if you had to give listeners free top tips to enable them to really improve their health and fitness for longevity and quality of life. Um, what would be your three top tips for that? Well, let's see. Know why you're working out, okay? <laughs> you know, if you credibly don't think you have the potential to be a bodybuilding champion, don't work out like a bodybuilding champion. <laughs> you know, work, work out enough and then get on with your life. Which, by the way, going back into the 70s and 80s, was kind of the point of Nautilus marketing which was, look how efficient we made strength training. You'll have time to do other things like practice or do martial arts or do sports or whatever, which I think is a lot healthier attitude than the attitude that came later, which is all the physical activity you'll ever want or need could be done in 20 minutes a week. You know, that last one, I just think it's kind of a non-starter with a lot of people and very arguable. So, but anyway, but so the first tip would be know why you're working out. You know, no reason to be trying to bar- bench press and deadlift and throw kettlebells around if they have no relevance to your life. 
Let's see. That's the big one. <laughs> to be honest with you, that's the big one. You know, the other thing too is, well, I'm keeping in mind that you sprung this question on me, but, uh. <laughs> yeah, um, sorry, I've cut, of course. But the other thing too is, like, you know, stop looking, right? Like, once you have a routine or a diet that works for you, there's no magic secret out there, which won't help the uh, industry sell books or sell DVDs or whatever, but, you know, having spent a lot of the last, you know, 40 years looking for the magic secret and realizing there's no magic secret, just regularly exercising and not eating so much that you get overweight, that's the secret. When you, um, I saw some pictures of you actually, when you, I, I think I saw some pictures of you, um, when you were um, at your, your best and uh, you were, were you a bodybuilder, a professional at one stage? No, but I did do a couple of contests and I may have put them on the uh, Congruent Exercise face- <laughs> Facebook page. Uh, I also put them on the blog. I put the talk I did in October on the blog, and there is one physique picture of me on there, yeah. Ah, I thought that was you. Okay, so what is it you did to get to that level? Can you remember? Yeah, literally six weeks before the contest, I started doing a half hour of the old Nordic track a day, and then I did... uh, What is that, sorry? Is that that some kind of cardio machine or something? It was a cardio ergometer. It was to mimic cross-country skiing, and it definitely has not been nearly as prominent, but that was a great device. So literally, I did a half hour of cardio a day, I dieted, and I probably did 10 minutes of weight training right after that, that cardio. And my diet wasn't, uh, I was working outside of fitness at the time, so I had to keep my wits about me, so my diet wasn't too severe, which is probably why I did the cardio, right, because I couldn't go too low. I remember listening to the other competitors, and these guys were eating ridiculously small amounts of food, you know, like an apple a day, a chicken breast a day. No way. Well, to just, just to just cut, cut to body cut, fat. Yeah. And, and these guys would be, like, admittedly, by their own admission, completely cockeyed. They just couldn't think straight. They could barely, you know. One guy said, yeah, I can, uh, all they have the energy to, is train, to do is train and sleep. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I got two small kids. I got a mortgage. I got a job. <laughs> so, again, you know, the context was I couldn't really get too extreme diet-wise. But that was it for six weeks. You know, six weeks, um, I think the... When I looked my best, like the closest I could ever look to Frank Zane, if that name rings a bell. Yes. I think there was a product out that had ephedrine in it, and which was the thing that kind of speeded you up a little to, to burn fat, which seemed to work. Okay. And, but then I what went off What is that product it. called? I think it used to be called Ripped Fuel. Right, okay. But they've since banned it because, you know, people had heart attacks. <laughs> right, okay. But that was the extent of my dabbling. That was, you know, over-the-counter stuff. So there were, it wasn't a steroid or... or is it no, it was it was ephedrine. It was just something that was like I think it was like a former asthma medication. It was just something that kind of sped your metabolism up. And I might have used I think I used it twice, like for two six week stretches. And the first six week stretch, when I ran out, I crashed so hard that like I didn't use it so much that I was obviously jittery. But it must have been keeping me on enough of an edge that when I ran out and I didn't refill it right away, I mean, I crashed around 4 o'clock in the afternoon and just slept straight through. So so that wasn't something I went back to, I mean, other than for that one contest. Right, right, okay. Uh, what did the, sorry, what did the rest of your, your regime look like? That was it. You know, the, hard, the, the working out was the easy part. The hard part was the six and a half days of dieting. <laughs> Oh, so is it just leading up to the contest? That's when the dieting came and just to drop the last few percent. Well, the, the, well, now I say that, but keep in mind, like I pretty much work out all year round since I've been 12 years old. So, you know, that's what I would do the six weeks before the contest to lose as much fat as I could and have as trim a waist as I could. The rest of the time, I would do like I like I've said, like a very hit influenced workout of minimal sets. You know, may, maybe a warm-up set and a, and a heavy set. And at the time, I was do, do, using, like, more set extenders, like rest pause. But it was still, like, you know, so, so most of my training during the year might be two hard half hours of weight training a week. And, you know, a functional cardio, like walking back and forth to work. But before the contest, I would bear down and make a point of doing a half hour cardio a day and the extra hard dieting. Right, okay. How, however, however, however on, I, am sorry, not, yeah. I am not an extensive competitor. You know, I, I probably, if I did three contests, three or four contests in the 90s, that was a lot. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, what is, uh, j- just before you go on to your, I think, have you provided one or two tips? I can't remember if you merged into one or 
provided two top tips. I believe I, I went into one and I was trying to duck the other two. <laughs> <laughs> so before we do get onto that, um, just in terms of diet, now this is a really interesting subject because um, there's a lot of controversy around, um, you know, kind of the high fat, right. and moderate protein, low carb diets that are becoming more popular. Mm-hmm. Um, versus the vegan um, people, uh, the high-car people, which is quite interesting, actually, because it goes back to what you were saying about um, people bashing other people's ideas, trying to inspire them, or other right. people's um, preferences, which really doesn't help, and I find that's what a lot of the vegans do, to be quite honest with you. Um, and the paleo guys do also. Yeah, do they? Well, then that's my fault for not, not seeing that. Um, do, what is your view around, uh, around diet and uh do you have a do you have do you think there's a specific diet that we all thrive on, or do you think we're omnivorous, or we're supposed to be on you know omnivorous all, all year round, or what's your view on, on diet exactly? When clients want a diet, I tell them, look, pick the diet that you're comfortable with and do it for 5.9 days a week, because for whatever reason, some people like high carbs, some people like no carbs. I think it probably is individual. Preference, but but also there might be an individ- there might be a real reason why somebody thrives on one or the other. Practically, though, I just tell them do it 5.9 days a week. Take one day completely off where you're not thinking about your diet, and then two or three days later have a treat just to keep you mentally on track. And that idea actually came from a client who was pretty successful in losing some weight. And I said, man, that is brilliant, right? Because uh, if you're trying to diet every single day. That gets mentally wearing, and and I thought that was a really elegant solution. You know, I've dabbled in all of them also, and I'm just not compelled to one extreme or the other. I probably don't eat, you know, I I remember again, going back to Menser, at the time in the 70s, he was not a big high-protein guy. You know, I thought he was pretty convincing that between, I don't know, 60 and 100 grams of protein is probably enough for most adults. So my own diet doesn't really lean extreme in either direction. You know, if, if I want to lose weight, I tend to have salads for lunch instead of sandwiches. But that's probably just from cutting out the two pieces of, you know, 300 calories a day from the bread. Interesting. So is that, sorry, just so I understand this 5.9, I thought that meant five days. Oh, actually, 5.9, I see. So, uh, yeah, so right, I got you. Okay. So take one day off, so now you're down to six. Yep. And so now the treat counts as 0.1, which maybe it's not. Maybe it's 0.2. <laughs> who knows? But I'm just saying, you know, take that treat on a Wednesday. <laughs> To, yeah. to, to keep you mentally charged up and they can get back on track. Plus, I find, too, that if somebody gets in the rhythm of a diet, that cheat day isn't too bad. You know, they don't go crazy on yeah. that, cheat, that cheat day. Yeah. So now, when you when you first said 5.9, I was thinking 4.9. I was thinking you have, you finish maybe at 6 p.m. on a Friday and then you go nuts till Sunday night. That's what I thought you meant. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> that's, that's called not being on a diet. Yes, yeah, yeah. I think most people are familiar with that. <laughs> yes, that's right, right, right. But again, I'm not too dogmatic on carbohydrates versus, you know. I also generally tend to people, look, eat what you eat, just eat less if you have to lose weight. I know plenty of other people are very, very passionate about that type of stuff, but... Fair enough, okay. Because I'm, um, I'm actually currently doing uh, Dave Asprey's Bulletproof Diet. Mm-hmm. Um, you familiar with that? Yeah, a little yep. bit, yeah. So I've, uh, purely because... And read his book, The Bulletproof Diet, and eventually decided to buy his coffee, although I don't even like coffee, but just because his marketing is so damn good. Okay, um, well, okay. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and because, and also because of the, I was kind of, you know, I, I was interested in the performance benefits. You know, I've got a lot of projects on myself, and I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm more focused on trying to be healthy and, and, and perform as well as I can. Um, so I've personally, I'd be the first to admit if it's placebo, but I find that having bulletproof coffee in the morning with butter really does help me focus for a long period of time. Um, so I'm kind of a, a believer, I suppose, at the moment of, um, of the kind of high fat, moderate protein, low carb approach. Um, although you're reminding me to stay open minded about this kind of stuff. Well, I am curious how the high fat guys are going to fare later in life. I really. I understand they have their arguments about cholesterol's not that bad and you know, conventional they have their negative view of conventional diet advice. But it is gonna be kinda of interesting to see what happens. Mm. So you think there's no kind of real conclusive evidence that um a high fat diet is healthy long term? 
Well, it's not that, that I don't think so, it's, but I, I think most conventional dietitians don't recommend it. Hmm. And if they're the ones studying it, I mean, I'm, I'm not, again, I understand there's, there's flaws in conventional thinking, but, but again, I do have to say it's not really a passionate point with me. If somebody eats a certain way, I'm not going to discount their observation. Mm-hmm. Or even if they train a certain way, right? I'm not, I mean, who am I to discount their own observations? If, if you say that this is what's happening, I trust you're paying attention. I used to know Barry Sears, the guy from the Zone Diet. Oh, yeah. So about 20 years ago, I did some work with him. And even though the Zone Diet got the reputation as being 40, 30, 30, you know, carbohydrate percentage, fat, protein percentage. Yep. He said that in reality, everyone probably has their own percentage that works for them. Mm-hmm. And that 40, 30, 30 isn't going to be too far off for, any, for most people. And I think there's some truth to what he said, because I knew people who would like, criticize 40, 30, 30 as not being enough carbs. And when I would ask them what they eat, they, they ate like 95% of their diet was from carbohydrate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think there is some truth to that, that everybody has a ratio. And you know, sometimes you stumble on it accidentally. And sometimes, again, if you're, just, if you're observing the effect it has on you and it's working for you, that, that counts. Yeah, and that's, that's a good point. Now, have you had enough time to think about the final two tips? Or do you want to just leave it at one for, to underscore what you've already said? Well, let's see. What, what did we say for the first <laughs> tip? The first tip was know why you're working out, I think. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, yeah I like that one a lot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, no, no, why are you working out? And also, uh, did we say stop looking? Yes, you did. We said stop you looking, did. right? Stop looking for the magic answer. The magic answer is to just do it regularly uh, and stop looking for the magic answer. And let's see here. Well, not to get too philosophical, but you kind of touched on it, is, you know, it's really not necessary to be entirely judgmental about other people's preferences exercise-wise or diet-wise. You know, I don't follow that at all. Mm-hmm. Again, I'm not an anything goes kind of guy. Again, if you do something, you think it works for you, and it's not hurting, more power to you. You know, it might not be what I find, but you know, they might. Different things are right at different times in your life. It, it may come back later to help. Interesting. Just re- reminds me of how complex health and fitness really is. And since starting Corporate Warrior and speaking with people like you, it just makes me realize, well, I've, I've got him well over my head here. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, right. Well, yeah, right. Yeah. Some people don't have the double negative, right? They don't know what they don't know. <laughs> you know, it's easy to be... Uh, I knew so much more when I was younger. <laughs> you've just, you've lost me there. What do you mean by that? Well, in other words, now I realize there's a lot I don't know, which is kind of why I stick with the whole biomechanics and exercise stuff. Right. But... You know, coming just out of college and starting personal training, oh, I knew high intensity was the way to go, and this way to diet was the only way to go. Mm-hmm. And then you put it into practice and you realize, oh, wait a minute, that didn't quite work, quite work the way I thought it was going to work. So, you know, I think you're experiencing, you're starting to realize what you don't know, yes. right? The people who don't know what they don't know, those are the ones who are kind of dangerous. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you 100%. Yeah, I should be thankful that I'm in the, the position I am in, indeed. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add, Bill, or talk about, but um, you've done a great job answering every question I've thrown at you, so um, we can wrap it up there if, if there's nothing else you want to add. Well, let me just say um, yeah. uh, people should feel free to connect with me on... Oh, absolutely. Sorry. Yeah, cool. Well, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn under Bill D. Simone because that's where I'm going to be posting links to old material on a regular basis, and that's where I'll be publishing new stuff. Or if the people want to wade through all the old material, they can go to congruentexercise.blogspot.com, mm-hmm. which has either the actual old material or links to old material on that website. The uh, YouTube channel, which I believe I have about 18 videos on, mm-hmm. is, uh, well, I put it at tinyurl.com slash videos. Okay. And then... The Amazon link is tinyurl.com slash ceamazon, which is where Congruent Exercise on Print and Kindle is at. Say that again, sorry. It's tinyurl.com slash ceamazon. Okay. And that's where the Congruent Exercise on Print and Kindle is uh, for sale. Perfect. Okay. Um, Thank you for reminding me about that so I'll get all your uh, information and, and contact details onto the, into the show notes as well and so people can check that out 
Well, thanks, and, you know, and I really appreciate you putting my links on that uh, podcast you did with Doug McGuff. No, you're welcome. It's good information. What uh, Actually, what happened was I got a, an email from a, an attorney in Seattle, which is across the country from me, uh-huh. and he was looking for a trainer for his dad who happened to live not too far from me, and he said, yeah, I've looked at your material online, and I think you'd be a good fit. And I said, how did you stumble onto my material? He goes, oh, it, it was at the end of a podcast. And I said, well, that's interesting because I haven't done any podcasts. <laughs> so, oh, wow. Uh, and he didn't remember the name of the podcast either, but he said, well, it had something to do with McGuff. So I did my Google detective work and found it. And I listened to the podcast and I said, gee, McGuff mentioned me for two seconds. And Lawrence listed all my contact information. So I really yeah. appreciate that. No, you're welcome. I, I obviously knew about you in advance of that, and uh, I wanted, if it was a good opportunity, to just get the, all the stuff that I knew you had on there. But that's amazing, isn't it, that it's a uh, you know, small world, um, how the internet connects us all, isn't it? Well, and especially since um, Anne-Marie Anderson and uh, the late Greg Anderson, friends of mine, are in Seattle, and I said, oh, how'd you hear me? Did Greg and Anne-Marie tell you? He said, no, I don't know them. <laughs> so, oh, well. Uh, so he was listening to. So he in Seattle was listening to a, a podcast from the UK to get in touch with me in New Jersey. <laughs> Amazing, that's, that's crazy, and it's it's very. Um, I guess I'm very fortunate that Doug's been promoting it, um, promoting my my website through his. Obviously, he gets quite a lot of traffic, and he's, he's very well known now. Um, right. So that's pretty awesome. Um, do you see Doug and, and those guys, or very the kind of HIT guys, very often? Do you kind of meet up, or is it just at things like the Twenty One Convention? Well, we're we're not geographically close. Oh, of course. Yeah. You know, he's in the <laughs> South. I'm in the Northeast. Bo Raley's in Indianapolis. Uh, Carlson's in Minnesota. But um, if something like the Twenty One Convention or the Minnesota Conventions, uh, we'll cross paths, and of course we're in touch online periodically. But it is very interesting that it used to be. You didn't really know the names. You knew the names from something in print, but you didn't actually interact with them. And now, like, you know, again, here we are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, is there, just on that, actually, um, is there anyone else that you'd recommend I should approach or that you could int- introduce me to for future interviews? Well, let's see here. Well, uh, Roger Schwab in Mainline Health and Fitness in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. And Roger has one of the few X-Force lines in the U.S. Roger is a contemporary of Darden, and he had been a, a judge in Arnold's competitive days. All right. So he's a very interesting guy to talk to, and in phenomenal shape. Phenomenal shape, period, and he's old enough to have been a contemporary of Arnold and Darden, so that tells you something. <laughs> wow, that is, that is a very impressive. Oh, yes, in fact, you know, I, saw a, I saw a video of him working out on your, um, on your oh. blog, and I was very impressed. Probably, yes, yes. yes. Let's see who else. Uh, Luke Carlson, he had put on the Hit Resurgence conferences for the last three or four years, okay. uh, but I, which I think he's, he's renamed for this year. I believe he's renamed it. I'm not sure what he renamed it. That's, that's, that's okay. I'll, um, but yeah, it's Luke Carlson at Discover Strength. He's doing some interesting things in Minnesota. Adam Zickerman in New York City for in- Inform Fitness. Okay. What might be the best way to, to approach these guys? Just directly or? Yeah, d- directly. And you can tell them that I referred you in, in their direction. I appreciate that. Excellent. Anyone else that comes to mind? You know, at the risk of offending people, no, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, that sure, sure won't be interpreted like that. Cool. Okay, Bill, well, thank you very much for your time this evening, um, or this afternoon where you are. Uh, it's very, very much appreciated, and I really enjoyed talking to you and getting your perspective on all this. It was, it was really great, so thank you very much. Well, thank you, Lawrence. I appreciate it. Enjoy right. it. All the best, and uh, perhaps we'll do a part two at some point. Very good. Nice one. Take care, Bill. Take care, too. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye.